After such a heavy series on Jeremiah, let's do something even heavier, the Trinity. Um, it's attributed to Tertullian that if you try to study the Trinity, you'll lose your mind, which I felt like I did this week. I felt a little, a little bit mad at one point. I was like, man, like. But if you deny the Trinity, you lose your soul. Um, the Trinity is, yeah, it's very, very complex. Very, very complex document, um, doctrine, to say the least. Just getting my laptop up now. But it's super important for us, for our salvation, for our faith, for who we are as God's people. And so, yeah, today we're going to spend the, the first part looking at God the Father and also doing an introduction to the Trinity. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thanks, Ian. Um, Ooh, all right. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, all right. Um, we kind of figured that out of the three parts of the Trinity, the Father is the one that in some ways we probably actually know and understand the most about because he is the traditional sort of way that we view God. And I think that this is why we're going to be spending the first half on the Trinity as how they kind of all work together and then we'll get into the Father. But if you have any questions today about the Trinity as a whole, I'm not saying we're going to be able to answer them, but it'll be great questions, I think, anyway, to even bring up. And then we will ex explore the Father. So be thinking about today both questions about the Trinity and about the Father. But this kind of puzzle that is the Trinity, this sort of enigmatic theological mm. mystery, has been something that's been kind of plaguing church fathers for centuries, yeah. right? Yeah, so if we can go to the first slide. Here's, a, here's here a, a, a painting of St. Augustine. And the, according to legend, and it changes around a bit, when St. Augustine was writing his book on the Trinity... Bit like me was gone a bit mad and decided to go for a walk on the beach and there he saw a little boy had a hole and he had a seashell he was scooping up the water and augustine asked the boy oh what are you doing he goes i'm trying to fill the ocean into my hole and augustine's like that's, that's impossible you cannot do that and this is where the the legends kind of you know changed the boy apparently looked at augustine and said my um Indeed, um, it, the child looked at him and said, indeed, but I will sooner draw all the water from a sea and empty in his hole than you will succeed in penetrating the mystery of the Holy Trinity with your limited understanding. Uh, apparently the boy disappeared. So that is how the story goes. But I think it's a great illustration that we are like children trying to fill the ocean into this tiny hole. We are dealing with God who is so beyond our finite comprehension that... Yeah, this is just our meagre attempts to try to understand him mm. a little deeper. Mm. And so obviously this idea, first of all, that God is one, that in and of itself, especially for Jews in the Old Testament, was quite a revolutionary idea for the ancient Near East, right? Mm. So for a community coming in saying we worship a single God, God is one, what would have that meant for the surrounding sort of tribes, surrounding sort of people? Yeah, um, so if we can go to the next slide, thanks, Matt. This is the Shema, Shema Israel. You would say this every day. Here, the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. That's what Jews pray every day. What's radical about this is the Bible claims that Yahweh is not just a tribal God, a God of this little area of Canaan, the Bible declares that Yahweh is creator. He is Elohim, which is a, a, the Hebrew word for God. God over all the world. Every nation believed that different gods had different areas. You know, gods of war, gods for the Canaanites, gods for the Babylonians, all that. The Bible declares that there is one God over everything. That's what's unique about it, that he... And what, uh, what this God does is he doesn't have a consul, he doesn't have a wife. He creates by speaking, mm. which is also radical. He doesn't create by fighting or defeating other gods. He creates by speaking, not without having a wife. It's just utterly unique from the ancient world to this belief in one God. Mm. 
Um, we might just quickly uh, check. I think Mentimeter might not be working and I oh, can no. kind of chat about. So obviously this idea of the Trinity is something that we as Christians understand and accept as doctrine. But funnily enough, the word Trinity is nowhere in the Old Testament or New Testament. But what we are given is insight into how we should understand this. So if we see the new trendy language in the New Testament, which is, yep, perfect. Um, yeah, Matthew 28 is a kind of very clear one where Jesus is calling his disciples. It's the Great Commission at mm. the end of Matthew. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we see right here, even again in 2 Corinthians, when Paul writes, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. So we're kind of assuming, again, and this is something we'll talk about in a bit, but sometimes God the Father can just take on the title of God, which can get a bit confusing because he is obviously a unique part of the Trinity. Um, and we can sometimes almost elevate the Father to a higher level of God because when we're talking about the Father, we can just say God. And that's fine. There is nothing wrong with that because the Father is God just as much as Jesus and the Holy Spirit are God. But we can limit maybe the understanding of how much Jesus and the Holy Spirit are God when we only ever refer to the Father directly as God. But anyway, tangent, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And then finally, 1 Peter 1, 1 to 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he essentially at the end says, you have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. So there's this idea that we see, this is obviously a theology and a doctrine which continued to be formed and refined with the early church fathers, but it is very clearly in the New Testament as something that mm. is theologically true and sound. Mm. So one of the things that... I guess as the Hebrew Bible, it gives us this idea of God being three persons in one. And we'll look at this quickly when we explore Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that yeah, the Trinity just didn't appear out of thin air. But what the Bible does, it gives us narratives. So it tells a story and just kind of leaves us hanging. And my favourite is, and we'll pick up next week, is when Abraham invites three guests, two of them are angels, one of them is Yahweh. Mm. And you're like, What? That's, that's just what it says, is that there's three men. One of them is the Lord, Yahweh. And Abraham talks to him about Sodom and Gomorrah. And you're like, I I'm trying to process that about what that means. And so that's how the Hebrews operate. They tell stories, drop these massive bombshells mm -hmm. that you're left scratching your head about. Mm -hmm. And so when we got to the New Testament times, the church, as it became less Hebrew and more Greek, started putting in language that wasn't from the Scripture, but a way to help us. Mm -hmm understand the Bible better. And so, as you can see in these passages there, we have what is called Trinitarian theology. But the word Trinity is not there. So, if we look at the next slide... We might just quickly check, is the Mentimeter there, there working? There is working, and we have... Oh, someone's, uh, asked, uh, someone's asked us a couple of questions, which we we'll might pick up towards Sounds the good. end. And one of the questions that just came through is, where did the word Trinity originate? Mm. Well, it just means triune. Well, that was easy. Um, so... The technical word, if you look in a systematic the theological textbook like this, you can knock which someone I had out to, with that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Which is, I had to look at at Bible college. I had to read like two of these to pass. It was, and you, yeah, it's something that you have to do when you go to college. The, the, do, the, the definition is the doctrine of the Trinity means that there is one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God is one in essence, three in person. And that, that's kind of the, that's what most Christians will talk about. But that's also confusing. The le word of person. It's mm. like, well, what? Yeah. When I think person, I think you. I'm a person. You're a person. person. Yeah. Like there's a person. Um, yeah. The word person could mean mask in, in Greek. And so there, there is confusion there. So sometimes the church will talk about essence. God is one God, but three in essence. It's confusing. But just because it's confusing and difficult doesn't mean that we shouldn't study it mm. and explore it because our salvation rides upon this if god wasn't triune if god wasn't a trinity the three in one you and i wouldn't be here because jesus wouldn't have come to save us god wouldn't have sent his son the spirit wouldn't come to sanctify us and that's why i actually was keen to do this series is that every week when we come into church and we worship we're actually worshiping god as a trinity whether we recognize it or not. 
in the language that we mm. use, the fact that we just had communion earlier, we're worshipping this God who is Father, Son and Holy mm. Spirit. And just having a great grounding in that, I pray today is that you'll develop a deeper love for God, but a more expressive faith in the God that we worship. Mm. So we, these are some big words, Trinity, persons, being, essence. It's like it can go a little bit over your head. But as that quote I said before, if you deny it, if you study a Trinity, you're going to lose your mind, but if you deny it, you will lose your soul. Mm. And this is how God has revealed himself. And so mm. just because it's hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't study it. Mm. So let, let's... let's yeah. So, um, well, like, I know that a lot of us probably first came um, to teaching of the Trinity, probably maybe in Sunday school or youth group or just somebody trying to explain it in an applicable way and uh, accessible way. I think one of two very popular uh, metaphors that we have seen is either God is water, right? So as far as in um, the way of the Trinity, water can exist in a gas, a liquid or a solid. And then likewise, God is an egg. You've got the shell the yolk and the white. Now, these metaphors are obviously helpful to get us into the room to start to understand the Trinity, but it's actually, they've both got their own limitations. And we're going to look at, in a second, we won't go to that slide yet, how both of these analogies fall short. But I want to encourage us in the, just this next few minutes, turn to the person next to you, choose one of those two metaphors, and try to figure out for what we've been speaking about so far and what your understanding is of the Trinity, where do those metaphors fall short? We'll give you a couple of minutes to chat about it, and then we'll come back in a second. So where do those metaphors, just choose one of them, fall short when describing the Trinity? All right, why don't we put you out of your misery? Um, but thank you. Thank you for giving a red hot go. Because it is hard, right, when we start to try to engage with this stuff. So let's look at first the metaphor of water, solid, gas. Where this sort of falls short as far as understanding the Trinity in a more holistic way is its modalism. So, Mitch, what is modalism? Oh, modalism um, is a fancy way of saying that God um, is one... One God, but has revealed himself in like a mode, a different mode. So in the Old Testament, he's re revealed himself as Father, then revealed himself as Son, then revealed himself as Holy Spirit. So it denies God being one and three. And so that's probably if, if, a classified as a heresy, which is very strong language. The church had to fight against this. It's probably something that... Christians perhaps are unintentionally might think of where you don't recognize that Jesus and Father and, and the Spirit are all one. And so we just can kind of think, oh, in the Old Testament, God revealed himself as this angry Father, and the New Testament revealed himself as Jesus. Mm. And then now God is just revealing himself the Holy Spirit. Mm. It's like, well, just no, it's the one in three mystery. Yeah. So that's why modalism doesn't work. That's yeah. why the whole. Yeah, so God, God yeah. is all three things at the same time. He's not yeah. just one version. Yeah. He's not like a transformer where he's a car <laughs> yes. now, now he's a Megatron. It's yeah. like one different. That's good. It's all three at the same time. Yes, all and right, that's cool. why the, the solid liquid gas sort of doesn't work. All right. oh God. Cool. Yeah. So then with the Trinity as an egg for the shell, white and yolk, that sort of brings up its own little misunderstanding of tritheism. Yeah. So we've looked at modalism. What is tritheism? <laughs> tritheism. Where does that fall short? Yeah, it's like a Bible college lecture. Um, tritheism is believing that God is three. So three gods. It's probably something that not many of us would ever get confused about. But if you think of God being like that, that shell, the white and the yolk, you can fall in that danger of oh, God being... Like three. Yeah. Three gods. Yeah. But it's like, well, it's not actually. Yeah. That's the mystery of it is that Jesus isn't another God. He is Yahweh. Mm. The Father and I are one. The Holy Spirit isn't a separate God. And mm. so 
Yeah, that's that's yeah. what tritheism is, is, believing that there's three gods. Yeah. Like, I always say if I go to a cafe and order eggs on toast and just get shell on toast, I'm going to be really disappointed, right? Because that's <laughs> not what I ordered. And this is the idea where that falls short, where ultimately the shell doesn't actually represent the wholeness of God. And really, the yolk or the white doesn't fully represent the wholeness of God in the way that the Trinity is, the Holy Spirit is fully God, the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God. So then there's a third sort of heresy that we want to look at, which is Arianism, which we couldn't think of an applicable metaphor for. But do you want to unpack Arianism a little bit for us? Arianism is the belief that Jesus is, well, was a created being. So when you hear Jesus being the son of God, a number of religions believe this, say Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, that Jesus was the first and greatest created being. So Arius... Yeah, Ari- yeah, it's saying it way. Now, Arius was a, a heretic who taught that Jesus was the first created being. And mm. so Arianism is the belief that Jesus isn't God, mm. but just some sort mm. of angel. Yeah, and it's really interesting because a majority of the early church heresies were around the Trinity in some way or another. So it is confusing and it is something that the early church not only saw as something that needed to be defined more, but also something that when we get wrong is really problematic. So... Why don't we quickly jump to a video from Bible Project that's going to explain it probably much better than we will, and then we can come back after watching that. So I've got a question that's always bothered me. The Bible says there's one God, but in other parts of the Bible, God is three, Father, Son, and Spirit. How can it be both? Yeah, this is a question that has mystified people for thousands of years. And while we can't fully explain it, I think we can better understand what it is that we can't fully understand. (laughs) What do you mean? Well, think of it this way. Here's a two-dimensional plane. And then here's an object with three dimensions that's going to pass through the 2D plane. Okay, right. From this perspective, the 3D objects above and below the plane. So now it makes sense. But imagine you were a 2D person stuck on the 2D plane. What would you see? I don't know. What would I see? Well, it would look like this. Oh, yeah, okay. From this perspective, it looks impossible. It's one object, and then then two objects, and then three. But in reality, they're all one, just not in a way you're capable of understanding. Now, let's take this whole thing as a visual analogy for how we experience God. The claim in the Bible is that God is transcendent, a divine being through whom we live and move and have our being. Or, as God says, I am. Okay, but I live here in this universe, so when God appears, it will make sense in some ways, but in other ways, it will break my categories. Exactly. This happens all the time when people encounter the God of the Bible. So let's look first at how this happens in the Hebrew Scriptures. Throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, God appears in complicated ways that don't quite fit our categories. One common way this happens is with God's attributes. So an attribute is a way to describe what something is like. For example, a soccer ball is round. Right. Or God is wise. Yeah, great. Let's take God's wisdom. So the book of Proverbs says that God created the world by his wisdom. But then there are also poems in the book of Proverbs that describe God's wisdom as a person, a co-worker through whom God architected the universe. So God's attribute becomes a separate character? Yeah. This also happens with God's glory, which sometimes appears as a human figure on a throne that's engulfed in fire. Or take God's word, which he can speak to people, but sometimes his word appears like a person. Wait, so God's attributes have become new little gods? No, no. The biblical authors believe there's only one all-powerful God. But they're comfortable talking about them as different characters. Yeah, this is part of the way that the biblical authors portray the one God's complex identity. They're God's attributes and also distinct from God. Distinct from God and also God. Yes. Once we learn to spot that way of talking about God's identity, you begin to see it all over the scriptures. In fact, you find it in the first sentences of the Bible that mention the Spirit of God. So the opening line of the Bible is pretty familiar. In the beginning, God created. But then keep reading. Who is it that we see within creation hovering over the waters? The Spirit of God. 
Yeah, so the spirit refers to God's personal presence and energy that we can interact with here within creation. And so the Bible can refer to God's spirit as distinct from God. Distinct from God and also God. It's God's spirit. And while this sounds strange from our point of view, this complexity is what the biblical authors are trying to get us to see. So we've looked at God's attributes and God's spirit. Now let's make our last stop exploring God's complex identity in the Hebrew scriptures with a character called the Son of Man. So in the Bible, there's only one God that people are to worship, which makes this story in the book of Daniel really surprising. Daniel has a dream about a human figure called the Son of Man, which means a member of humanity. And Daniel dreams about this human getting elevated on a cloud, up and then higher up. Up into God's space. Yes, and then this human sits at the right hand of God's heavenly throne, and all humanity worships this human alongside God. A human where I expect to see God. Yeah, this human is a part of God's identity. This vision is about the climactic hope of the whole biblical story. God and humanity become one so they can rule the world together as one. So the Son of Man is distinct from God and also God. Exactly. So think back over everything we've looked at. In the Hebrew scriptures, God's identity is complex. And so when Jesus' followers encountered God as the Father, Son, and the Spirit, they already had categories for how these could all be the one God of the Bible. Okay, let's talk about that. Okay, so in the New Testament, we're introduced to Jesus of Nazareth. And he's human, but way more. His favorite title to call himself was the Son of Man. The figure in Daniel's vision. And the claim is that he is this complex God become human to unite other humans with God. Okay, so the Gospels portray Jesus as fully human. And also as Yahweh, the God of Israel. Jesus went around saying and doing things that only Yahweh can do, like forgiving people's sins or calming the chaotic waters. So they're saying Jesus is a human distinct from God and also God. Yeah, and that might sound crazy unless you've been reading the Hebrew scriptures, which prepared you for it. And then check this out. Jesus' first followers, the apostles, talked about his identity using the language of God's attributes. They called Jesus the glory of God, or the apostle Paul called Jesus the wisdom of God. Or John opens his gospel calling Jesus the word of God through whom the world was created. And then he says, the word was with God and was God. Okay, I get what they're doing and it hurts my brain. Totally. And if you want to spin your brain even more, consider this. Jesus, who's portrayed as God become human, would talk to God as a distinct person. And when he did, he called him Father. When Jesus talked about God, he wasn't referring to an abstract force or energy. He was talking about a personal being that you can relate to. There's a lot of personal images of God in the Bible. Ruler, creator, judge. But Jesus consistently referred to God as my father. Jesus experienced God as a source of infinite love. He said, the father has loved me since before the creation of the world. Apparently, Jesus knew the Father as an eternally others-centered, life-giving being. Right, like in the story about Jesus' baptism, when the Father says from heaven, this is my son whom I love. And then keep reading, in that story, the person who brings that message of love from the Father to the Son is the Spirit of God. So we've talked about God's Spirit. Here within creation, it's through the Spirit that we interact with the divine. Yeah, and the same was true for Jesus. Through the Spirit, he experienced the Father's love. But it didn't stop there. Jesus promised that through him, the Spirit would go out and share the Father's love with all humanity and with all creation. So it can look like these are three distinct gods, but in some way that transcends my view of reality, they're also one. Right. This is what later followers of Jesus called the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are the one God of the Bible. I could see how they got there. But this isn't just a philosophy puzzle. To describe God as a triunity is to claim that the universe is held together by an eternal community of love. Which is something that I can't really understand. But the God of the Bible isn't a being that you understand. The point is to know and be known by this God so that we can participate in his love. If we've got any uh, more questions, please feel free to pop them up. But we, let's we did have one, which I'm going to answer. So in Genesis 1.27, God says, let us make man in our image. Uh, and 
What's, what's interesting about that is there's a bit of debate about the let us mm. make man our image. Um, some people argue that it's God just talking to the divine council. So the divine council was the angels that would advise him on different things. Some see it as pointing to the Trinity. Mm. So not necessarily proving the Trinity, but showing that there is this unity together. And we sort of know that from Genesis 1 1, like, beginning, or I should say 1 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the world, and God said. And so we know that there's already mm. God's Spirit, God speaking. So the let us, and most Christian commentators will argue that it's not proving the Trinity, but it's pointing to there's a plurality of mm. persons there. Yeah. And, um, well, in the last few minutes of uh, today, let's look at God the Father. Uh, mm. And let's quickly just go through a few different images that we kind of famously know. Obviously, Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Uh, yeah, well, what's going on here? Oh, well, that's God creating Adam. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I understand it now. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So the, I suppose, representation of God in these... Oh, yeah, no, please feel yeah, free to go one. to the next one. Yeah, it seems to all have a similarity in all three of these images, the, the final one as well. Um, yeah, God, what do, you, what the, do you notice here? How is God the Father presented in all these images? Good beard, beard, yeah. yeah. And, and what's his age? It's old. And what does that do? If so, if the bulk of your the Western Christian art, which I actually think breaches Exodus, like Exodus 20 about not making an image of God, but if thou Im- implied image of God the Father is a bearded man in the sky, what does that do? It, it, well, for me, it limits the mm. God we worship. It, it limits so our perception of him. If you've had a, a bad father, you're going to think of God that way this bearded old man in the sky or you might think of him as a bearded grandfather figure in the sky and you say like shows like family guy mm. what's that movie called bruce almighty it's yeah, morgan, morgan freeman, freeman. yeah it's black guy in a white suit that's good yeah. yeah. it, it it reduces what god is mm. who he is and what he's done and so if there's only one thing to remember today is that god isn't a bearded man in the sky mm. god isn't a father's how we understand so there's obviously stuff in the bible where it talks about you know god's nostrils or god's hands and Mm. god's arms so what's going on there if they're describing these things that's an anthropomorphism anthropomorphism (laughs) all right so essentially just a metaphor (laughs) a metaphor (laughs) it's a putting human characteristics to god to describe something but it's interesting you talked about nose Mm. so let's let's when we think of God the Father, we often can re- think of God being angry. Yeah, the wrath of God. The definitely. wrath of God. So the Old Testament image of God as being this wrathful, angry, vengeful yeah, God. Yeah. And whether you know his name or not, many of us have been influenced by an early heretic called Marcion, who taught the Old Testament God was a God of wrath and anger and rage. The New Testament God was a God of love. And funnily enough, that's how we got our first canon because mm. Marcion got rid of all the Old Testament. He only kept the Gospel of Luke. The other three Gospels were too Jewish for him mm. and, only, and only Paul's letters. Mm. So and then so, the church's response was, yeah, we've got to, to figure out what's yeah. our official canon in response to this heretic. Yeah, and how we understand yeah, God of the Old Testament mm. and the New Testament. And yeah. so what's interesting, God the Father, if we look at the next slide, the depiction of God is from... So this is this self-revelation to Moses in Exodus 34. And God says here, the Lord or Yahweh, Yahweh, God, uh, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions and sins. And he will no means leave the guilty unpunished. Mm. That is the image of God as father. Mm. What's cool in Hebrew, Hebrew doesn't just use the word, oh, I'm slow to anger. To be angry in Hebrew is you like flare your nostrils or Mm. make your nostrils hot. So you know what the opposite of that is? Have a long nose. That's like, you can imagine reading that, you know, Yahweh, Yahweh is, you know, compassionate and gracious, long of nose. How awesome would that be? But that's the idea is actually God's wrath and anger, which we can, if we have that bearded white man image, this angry God, it's anger in response to evil and injustice. And if you read scripture, we see God's long nose everywhere. 
He doesn't, when we when we looked at Jeremiah, he didn't exile the, the Jews straight away. There was hundreds of years. There is so much warning. All that pain that is poured out, mm. that God, that's God's heart. That's God's heart as father. He doesn't want his children going astray. It's actually showing us this deep, deep love. And what's mm. cool too, there's a question about, I mean, God with male and female, is that word compassionate can also be womb. So this, it's built off that root word of womb. So even within God being depicted, depicted as a father, as a man, there's still like feminine characteristics. Both humans, male and female, carry um, the image of God. Mm. And so in that passage there, we see God is compassionate, like a mother, slow, <laughs> long of nose, I should say, slow to anger. Mm. And that's who God is. Yeah. As father is. Mm. So I want to respect everyone's time. Should we jump forward to so we what? We should, yes. Let's jump forward we to so We should indeed. Because so we're, we're heaps of questions. We have to pick up these next week. That's cool. So mm. um, maybe we could even do an episode of Banter this week. Yes. Those questions. So, so what? What is the relevance of God the Father? And I think in some way more importantly, what would we actually miss if we stripped God the Father from the Trinity? Yeah. So we see at the beginning of creation, God the Father is the God the creator, the one who speaks. We would miss that. We would be here. Planet Earth wouldn't exist. God the Father, and this is the mystery, which I still cannot wrap my head around, is that God knew what would happen, foreordained us. Mm -hmm. But it was God's plan to send Jesus for redemption. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have that. God the Father is all for our salvation. And Jesus reveals Yahweh as Father. Mm. It's interesting that in the Gospels, that Jesus prays to him as Abba. Abba is an Aramaic word, and most of the Gentile churches didn't speak Aramaic, but the early church recognized something so significant about this, to pray to God as Abba, as Father. Shows an intimacy, mm. a depth there. Jesus does that. We can too. We can be called the children of God. Mm. That's what, in many ways... Breaking up Father, Son, and Spirit, it's a little bit artificial because you can't. They're all interlinked. It's one God, three persons. Okay? If you can just walk away with that knowledge that, yeah, the Trinity is a deep mystery, mm. something deeply, deeply profound that we'll never wrap our head around. We're just 2D yeah, shapes living in a 3D. Or God's in that space. We just cannot comprehend that. What we can comprehend is that God loves us. Mm. God sent Jesus for us. And Jesus has made a way to pray to God as Father so we can have that deep intimacy with him. Mm. And just, yeah, finish off that. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. So, thank you. We'll unpack the rest of those questions in Banter this week. So if you've never listened to Banter, you'll have to listen in because there's some great questions that mm. came through. Mm. That's great. So Would you like to close in prayer? I'd love us? to close in prayer for us. Our Lord, as we yeah, have tried to briefly comprehend the mystery of you, Lord, I pray that we can be people who are comfortable and living in that mystery where we don't try to solve every different facet of you. I live with that mystery of you being one God, but revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And particularly today on Father's Day, to remember you as our Heavenly Father and that language that Jesus has given us, to pray to you as our Abba, as our Father. And Lord, that we will experience that deep intimacy of you. You are the God who is slow to anger. You're not a God of wrath. You are compassionate because you express that love to us by sending Jesus. So I pray your blessing upon us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.